Well, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first tutorial on how to use R. I, uh, I have to think that there are many biologists in the room right now who are thinking to themselves, if I wanted to be a programmer, wouldn't I have majored in computer science? Uh, but I, I have to submit that there are many times when you will want to do something relatively advanced in statistics or in uh, bioinformatics, and having a little bit of ability to program will go a very, very long way. So I only get five hours with you all to teach some very basics about programming, and I'm hopeful that this will give you at least a taste to get started uh, for when you have a, a data set challenge that really does require uh, some, some programming uh, chops. We don't have a, a, huge, um, a huge roster of programming things that we're going to attempt here. And I'm not really going to spend a lot of time on um, other languages other than R. Uh, so my, my hope is that this will, will get you the start you need. Uh, at the moment, I have a web browser open pointing to a particular Google Drive. Um, I believe you all received that URL this morning in mail. Uh, so you should be able to find a, an R programming A and an R programming B file in there. There will eventually be a C, D, and E as well. I haven't written the, the explicit text out on, on each of those. But for now, um, you should be able to open programming A text, um, copy it to your hard drive. I, I've opened it over here in my web browser so that I can just pull out sections of text. I hope that's useful. So how would I start with why a programming language at all is going to be necessary to you? I would say that most people here are not planning on writing a bunch of software, um, not in honors, not in masters, not in PhD. But being able to use software that someone else has created is very valuable to you. One of the most substantial packages of of bioinformatics software that's ever been created was released as the bioconductor um, infrastructure for R. A bioconductor lets you do an, a mind-boggling number of things, from working with microarray data sets and differentiating them on expression to even proteomic identification. Uh, so if I'm if I'm to pick a language that will let you do uh, let you have access to biostatistics and to bioinformatics. I feel like R has a lot of advantages there. There are also languages like Python that have a lot of adherence. Uh, certainly, if you work with uh, Peter van, van Heesten upstairs, he would be happy to teach you the ins and outs of Python uh, instead. But I would point out that learning a little bit of Python or learning a little bit of R is going to put you in equally good stead because a lot of the things that you can do in Python you could do an R and vice versa. So understanding data types and data structures, uh, understanding file input and output, these are things that are held in common across many, many languages. And if you decide that someday you're going to be writing in C or Pascal for that matter, the, the messages you pick up here will be just as relevant in those contexts. So uh, with that said, uh, I'm going to go ahead with uh, our tutorial here and we will uh, we'll find our way forward. I'm working a lot from, uh, a, a lot of this material was drawn from a tutorial that was produced over at Dataflare. Uh, I've given the URL here at the top of day one. I will try to add other links to each of the, uh, the scripts that we follow along the way uh, so that you can uh, have external resources to learn more about what we did that day. So I uh, have decided to work with R, um, just the R base package. Um, I think a lot of people will probably have installed R Studio instead. And that's a very reasonable thing to do. Um, I chose to use just R because it doesn't have all these other windows that are competing for screen real estate. As soon as you connect your computer to the projector, um, you get the, the resolution of the projector to work with rather than the uh, resolution that your monitor can handle. So, I'm going to be just working with R as it is. Uh, ordinarily, if I just started R, uh, you would see information about which version I'm using and stuff like that. Um, it won't matter if you're doing this in R, uh, in R Studio or R Console if you're using a different version than mine, because everything we're going to be doing is, is one of the most basic capabilities of the software for now. Okay, so let's start 
with uh, our plan of attack for the day. Um, I've already made allusion this morning in the lecture about data uh, about mapping uh, bits to numbers to talk about things like integers and floating point numbers and strings. Um, we're going to try to work through how those are implemented in R uh, as well. So I'm going to be starting with just a, a starting with the, the most basic kinds of things. How do we set variables and how do we uh, uh, how, what kind of operators we can use on them. So I, I'm sure that plenty of us have done, uh, have, uh, have used, oh yes, please. Ah, right, 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 okay. Um, the URL uh, was shared around on the email list earlier. Um, okay, who, who does not currently have the script downloaded on their machines? Quite a few, okay. Um, let me see. I believe if you just type, let me grab the, here's this. All right, get the shareable link. Okay, I can just add you guys by name. That might be the simplest thing to do. Oh, except then your names are going to appear on the share, uh, on the, uh, the video if you, if that doesn't bother you too much. <laughs> well, the, the link, reads as follows. Okay, pull this here. <laughs> it's very uh, intuitive, very easy to memorize for everyone, I'm sure. Let me show that in a bigger font at least. Ugh, not that one. Sorry, set the font, font up to 20 point. <laughs> I made it copy twice, didn't I? I'm sorry, that's not going to be very intuitive. Uh, that's right, the, the members of your group would not have received the email sent to the honor students. I see, okay. Well, um, for now, for today, we're not going to be typing a whole lot of stuff in the script, so um, it might be easiest just to follow along for now. Should I keep leaving that up on screen for a little, little longer? Okay. That's a one, a capital J, capital E, capital H. Little C, big V, little V, six, little h, one, capital Q, capital K, little x, little i, five, little h, big W, big C, dash, six, big K, big V, seven, zero, little K, big O, little U, big F, uh, that is a lowercase l, the numeral one, capital M, Number five, big N. <laughs> and hopefully that worked. <laughs> All right. If I, re if I return to R, we can look at this most basic of oper operations. We have, we have three variables in, in play here. We have set, uh, we, we've used uh, the assignment operator this is a, a term that we frequently find in all kinds of languages. Uh, the equal symbol in this case to set a to the value of two. Uh, there's another way that you can, you'll also sometimes see this written. It practically does not have a huge amount of difference, but you'll sometimes see an arrow pointing that way. When people write it this way, they tend to say gets. So they, uh, a equals two or a gets two is roughly the same thing. Um, so we're, we're, after we do this, we can always use a whenever we wanted to use the, the value two. Um, we set the value of b to five, and now we've set c to be equal to a plus b. We have all of the, the usual options here. You, you can uh, leave off assigning the result like that and just type a plus b if you just want to know what the answer is. That's kind of an interactive mode thing. Generally, if you're writing a script, though, 
capturing that that sum is something you care about. You can of course do a divided uh, a times b. You can do uh, uh, sorry uh, b divided by a. Now I want to note that uh, we've already done a bit of sleight of hand by this. You you might think that there's nothing novel uh, in that operation, but we did just do something kind of odd. We divided two integers. We divided uh, five by two, but it didn't give us an integer back. It gave us a floating point value back. Did you spot that? Five divided by two is not an even number. And so the software has returned a floating point value even though we gave it two integers. I'm also going to show you uh, a, a special modulo operator that you probably, oops, sorry, what's it doing here? Haha, <laughs> sorry, I forgot the, the name of it. Percent percent is a modulo operator. That's kind of odd, isn't it? So in the first case, it, I think most people get why 5 divided by 2 is going to give a floating point number. It's not even. But modulo is an operator that tells us how much is left over if we were doing integer math. So 5 divided by 2 can go in two times. The remainder of dividing by 2, by two is 1 in this case. We divided an odd number by 2. That left us a remainder of 1. To, to say it another way, if you had 105 and you did modulo 10, the remainder is 5 because 10 goes into it 10 times evenly, leaving 5. So you can get remainders this way as well. Um, those operators are all kind of the, the standard ones. Uh, I always have to remind myself if this one works correctly. 3 and then the operator is to exponentiate, to take the second power of, of 3. This is like a, a power function, essentially. So 3 to the second power is 9. So we have these sort of standard ways that these operators work. Um, but at, if, you, if you start digging below the surface, you'll find that there are even more operators to work with. Now, this is a little different than functions. So a function. Um, can give you things, let me see, is the value of pi set? It's not, okay, so I, I gotta remember how, how that's, uh, that's well. So if, if we were to say pi equals 3.14159, um, we can also do, uh, apply functions to it, like round. So if I do round of pi, it gives me three. But I can also tell it, it that I want to round up or to round down. I can do things like floor of pi. I can do ceiling of pi. Oh, sorry. There we go. I'm sorry, I've forgotten some of the commands. So in effect, we're seeing some operators and we're seeing some functions, all of which can be used to manipulate numeric values. Is anyone feeling utterly lost at this point? Yes. Okay. Um, was it modulo that absolutely threw people away? Okay. Uh, what, what, what part was most confusing so far? What is floor to What is it? I don't know what floor or round Oh, okay. Um, well, we're accustomed to saying if you were to round, say, 7.2, we're trying to get an integer out of a floating number. So the, in this case, 0.2 is less than 0.5. It's in the, the first half of it, so it rounds it down. But you might want to enforce that you always want to round down. And in a case like that, you know, if you round round on 7.6, it rounds up instead of down. So I can also uh, force it to say I always want to go up or I, or I always want to go down. So if I say floor 7.2 or floor 7.6, I get the same result. Likewise, if I say ceiling of 7.2 or ceiling of 7.6, it's always going to give me 8. So you can think of these three as, as, as very, uh, very closely related functions. Round is to go up or down uh, to the nearest integer. Ceiling is going to take you to the next higher, and floor is going to take you to the next lower. They're all very closely related, and you might want to use those functions under different circumstances. Now, uh, I would like to use round, but I don't want to round to the nearest integer. I want to round to the nearest, uh, say, percentile or something. 
So I've forgotten how to do that, and I want to get some help. So I can say question mark round to get some help on it. <laughs> and my Wi-Fi is out, so that's really helpful. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not sure what I'm doing incorrectly there, but ordinarily you could say question mark on round, and round would the help for round would then pop up. Um, in this case, um, ah, if you just type round by itself, you can see that it, it's accepting a value x, which is the number we feed it, and it's also accepting a digits argument. So you remember a moment ago I set pi to this. If I want to round pi, but not to the nearest integer, but, but rather to the nearest hundredth, I can say round pi digits equals 2, and I get back 3.14. So lots of different things are available here. A lot of these functions that we're using have other parameters you can feed them that will alter how they behave. Round is not always going to give you an integer. If you've set digits uh, to another number than that, it's going to round to a different number of places. Okay, sorry for racing ahead. I, I, there's always a danger that I'm going to just jet past you, so by all means, stop me. Other, other questions on where things sit? All right. All right, I'm coming back in here. Now, I, I, we've already talked about math variables, but there are lots of variables that we might use that are not numeric in nature. Uh, and the, the first kind that I think really uh, surprises people would be tr uh, Boolean variables. So if I copy these, I can set a to true and b to false. Now, I note that there's another kind of, of way to provide this value. I can say a equals t, and I get the same result. I can say a gets t, I get the same result, right? As I mentioned, the assignment operator, whether you use the equal sign or the, the, the arrow pointing left, uh, produces the same result. But it might surprise you to think that you can do math on Boolean variables. So let's, let's look at some of the operators we've got there. Here we have the logical AND and logical OR. Before I execute these, what's going to result from doing an AND on A and B? Remember, A is true, B is false. So if I run a logical AND on true and false, what's the outcome? Ah, some math teachers skip past some sections, huh? Okay, well, we'll just, we'll just run it and see. Okay, people might remember this better if I drew a truth table. Do you remember what those look like? So I have a, uh, I have a, a, a little square with four cells in it, and each one has true up in the upper left corner, and then we get to false as we move out to the second row or the, or the one to the right. We'll, we'll just run through the, the, the set. I'm going to say uh, true and true. That equals true. So if both are true, the value of the anding of the two is also true. If I say true and false, I get false. What if I say false and true? Also false. And false and false is false. Okay. This kind of logic, anding and oring and exclusive oring and knotting and stuff like that, these things are very common uh, along the way. So having, having some mathematical equation that outputs to true or false as a guide to how the software is, what it's going to do next is important. Yes? Is that like how you say, um, like, if you say, if you say, if you say something, it's a little different. This, this is, um, this is Boolean variables as they were originally taught. It's not set theory per se, but you can think of it that way. Um, if you have a, a, a set of things that are objects of type A and a set of other things that are objects of type B, and you're asking which are in the intersection, that's an AND to say A and B would represent those things that are both in circle A and in circle B. Um, to say A or B, is the superset of it all to say everything that's within circle A or circle B or both. Yeah. Okay, so if we run this the other way, if we do the or operator, I can say true 
or true, if you're looking for where the or operator is, that's uh, the shift backslash on your keyboard typically. So if I say true or false, it still is true. If I say false or true, still true. If I say false, false, it's still false. Okay, so I realize that for some of you, math class may have been a, uh, a, a difficult place in secondary school, but this stuff does, does occasionally creep back into, our, uh, back into our lives. Okay, so those are the AND and OR operators. But there are more of them, and I wanted to show you these three. In this case, we are trying to get a, a Boolean outcome from numeric comparisons. So I'm just going to run that, that code straight out. OK, so this might not look like I'm asking any questions of the software, but in fact I am. If we look at this first one, we see 5 is greater than or equal to 7. 5, another way of saying, is 5 greater than or equal to 7? It, it clearly isn't. 5 is less than 7. It's not greater than or equal to it. So the software reports the out, that outcome is false. Now, I've done something really sneaky here, and I want you to take a moment to, to look at it. Here I've said 4 equals equals 4. Now, if, if you're just looking at this for the first time, you've never done any programming before, you might say, why are you trying to set the value of 4 equal to 4? Remember, we, we have all these things where we're saying a equals 4, but a equals equals 4? Why is that giving a true result, right? That's because a single equals and a double equals have completely different meanings in R. A single equals is an assignment to say a is getting the value of 4. To say a equals equals 4, on the other hand, is to ask a question. Is a equal to 4? Yes. To say, it seems invalid. What did you type to get the response? True. I typed true. Did you use like a capital T and write the rest lowercase? Right. That's sneaky, isn't it? So in in this case, uh, in, in the in the first case, all caps true uh, true or true it's being fed two Boolean values. But when you used a capital T, the software said, oh, you mean the variable named true, uh, named true with a capital T. So in this case, true, all caps, is a, is a logical value. Uh, true with a capital T is a variable name. All right, so we need to be careful about that. I, actually, I ran into that in my own script when I was writing that because as we get further down, I tried to teach the C function, the create function, and I had been using the variable name C for things, which looks like the, uh, looks an awful lot like the C function. So we have to be really careful about uh, caps as we go. Other, qu other quick questions before we move ahead. Do folks understand why uh, these last two lines are different? I could do something really evil like say true equals false. And now I can say true uh, is equal to true, and it says false. <laughs> so choosing variable names uh, carefully really does matter. <laughs> okay, I'm going to plunge ahead if there's a question. You, you, you looked like you had a good question. Oh, it's a stretch. A uh, good stretch. Okay, well, a good stretch is also worthwhile. All right. Uh, oh, I didn't really do those others. I'm sorry. Let, let me uh, retype this uh, last bit in here. Okay, so if we look at each of these three statements, in the first case, I'm asking, is 5 greater than or equal to 7? False, it is not. I could say 5 less than 7, I would get true, because it, it evaluates those and comes out correctly. Okay, so 4 is equal to 4? Yes, yes, that, 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 that's a truthful statement. What about bang? Did you see the bang equals? I'm sorry, a lot of computer scientists will see an exclamation point and say bang. 
it, it's not, I'm not just being excited about an assignment operator. So bang equals is to say, you can always read bang as not in this case. So for not equal to three is true. On the other hand, for not equal to four is false. Okay. Um, right. So we've already covered the, the less than, greater than operators. So is, is some of this basic math stuff sort of gelling? Is that is it, is it uh, more or less clear why the software is coming up with these responses? Okay. I'm going to return to our script then. So we're going to look at a lot of different data types. Um, I, I haven't really pointed it out yet, but I'll just, I, I didn't include this part in the script, but characters are also legitimate things to store in variables here. So if I have uh, my name, I can say my name equals David. And if I kick out name, it says David. Now what happens if I say uh, name plus one. I'm now doing a mathematical operation on a, on a character string. That doesn't really work. There are some, some functions you can use for comparing strings though. What if I, uh, what if I create another variable called other name equals David? And now I can say, does name equal other name? You see that? So now we've compared strings to ask if, if they are identical, and they are. Okay, I know doing, doing math on letters sometimes seems rather bizarre, but uh, I, I thought it was important to cover that possibility. There are times when you want to do that. Okay, oh yes, question. Yes? Yes, it will. Good, good, uh, good uh, check of that. What about name not equal David? Got the false. Okay. Good. Yes. So you're you're seeing that you can substitute variable names for values, but you can compare just values to values for that matter. You can say, is David equal to David? Which is kind of a metaphysical statement in a way. Uh, that's, that's fine. Okay. Feel free to use your own name, that's also okay. Now, R has superpowers. And one of the best things that R allows us to do is, um, is parallel operations across, across large vectors of numbers. So what is a vector? A vector is uh, something we all use all the time in computer science, but I realize it might be a little unfamiliar to you. So I would just say that a vector is a string of many items of the same type. Many items of the same type. And in this case, we're going to use the create function in order to make some vectors. So let us, uh, let's run these three, uh, these four lines. Okay. So now we're, we're taking on functions that have multiple inputs and multiple outputs. So I'm going to report all of the values that we just got there. So A was created as a string of integers. We gave it the number 2, the number 8, the number 43, the number 3, and the number 8, and told it to create a vector that includes all of those. And now we see that A is that whole string of them. We set up B to be the numbers 21, 7, 9, 34, and 4, and we gave it all of those. And now those are all stored in it. And then we've computed sums. But what I'd like you to tell me is what did it sum? All right, it, it did a little looking at these. It said, okay, well, the first value of A can be compared to the, or can be summed with the first value of B. The second value of A can be summed with the second value of B. But before we get to that point, we might even think, I just said that a vector is a series of values of the same type. But what happens if you try to, to break that rule? I'm going to just make another vector, we'll call it C again. Well, I'm not going to do that because the function we're using to create it is called C, so that's a little misleading. I'll just say D equals 1, 2, 
three, four, David. It cheerfully did it. Now, how is that result different from Do you see what the software has done? In the case where I created D to include the string David along with the numbers, R said if any of them is a character, all of them are characters. So I can't do math like D plus one. None of the members of D are numbers. They are all strings. Can I say E plus one? I can. In this case, it's. Uh, oh, I, I had one other thing I wanted to check here. Um, if I set up, um, if I set up a to be just the numbers one and two, and b is equal to c one two three four. Oh, sorry, huh, I mistyped. And I type a plus b. Something weird happens. Did you notice that? Now, why, why, can't, why would it seem I cannot add together A and B? I'm going to use another function. It's, it's a function is pretty straightforward, length. So I'm asking, how many items are there in A? How many items are there in B? But now, I've added A to B, and it gave me a perfectly fine result. What happened? Do you see it? One got added to one to create two. Two got added to two to create four. But because a is uh, because the length of b is a multiple of the length of a, it said, "Okay, I've run out of items in a. I'll just reuse them." I, I don't, I'm not trying to confuse you, but I, I want you to see that the software will do what it deems logical if you do something like this. If you give it two items and you tell it to add it to four items, it's going to double the pair of items. So we added one to one, two to two, one to three, and two to four in order to produce two, four, four, six. All right. I, I, I don't mean to, to, to stress all of the odd things that the, these computers can do. Um, but I, I do want you to be able to, to catch it when you are programming for yourself and something odd happens. Okay, so to return to this, nope. we added together the, the, uh, the two vectors that were equal in length. We can check that with A and B. They're both five in, in length. And so when we computed the sums and stored them in the variable sums, we got another vector out with length 5. It had 5 items here to add to 5 items there and output a, a series of 5 sums. All good so far? Okay. Um, now, sometimes, having created a vector like sums, you want to grab out an individual item. So in this case, if I want to grab out the, the second item of sums, I can do that. You see up here, 23, 15, 52, 37, two, uh, 12. I've now grabbed out the second item of this list of five as sums two. So this is called the index operator. And the index operator lets you grab out individual items from a longer list. But again, there are some odd things it can do. So I'm going to pull out this another example down here. What on earth happened? Why, why would it return two values here? OK, so we, we can look at what did we feed the index operator, the square brackets. So C2, 4. We're giving it a series of two numbers, 2 and 4. And we applied that to this string of sums up here. So 23, 15, 52, 37, 12. So the index operator, when passed the numbers 2 and 4, gives us the second item and the fourth item from the longer list. OK, so indexing is very, very powerful for when you're trying to grab out a subset of, of those items. All right, 
Now, we're going to get to some of the curious ways that we can use the series operator. The, the colon by itself is a very powerful little, uh, little creature. So here I've given it the numbers 1 through 20 inclusive, and I'm telling it to multiply each of them by 2. So if I look at the value of evens that pops out, I see that I have 20 numbers, and they are the evens running from 2 to 40. Now I want to note that what we've done here is another case where we are multiplying a very short uh, a very short string to, uh, uh, a very short vector times a very long vector. Here we have 20 numbers in 1 through 20. If we type 1 through 20 by itself, we see what comes out of that. 1 through 20. But when I do 2 times 1 through 20, it says, all right, he's given me a vector of just one number, the number 2, and a vector that's 20 long, the numbers 1 through 20. So it must mean he wants to multiply 2 by every item in this other vector. Okay, so that's, that's how the evens worked out there. Uh, let me see, so series, I did a, another uh, line right there, series equals 14 to 20. You see that you're, you're not, when you use this, um, this series operator, you're not required to start at 1. Uh, the software will go ahead and do that stepping uh, uh, item by item for this. All right. Um, now, there are a couple that are worth knowing about as well, like the repeat function. The repeat function is not, is not like, an, it's not an operator like series. It's a function meaning it's got these, uh, these parentheses to receive some value. The repeat operator's goal is to repeat whatever you give it as many times as you specify. So here I've given it a special value. Uh, remember, true and false were defined values because we use Boolean variables. In this case, I'm using NA, which is a another defined value. But what is NA? not applicable. So that too is a defined value in the context of R. And I've asked it to repeat not applicable 10 times. Uh, so what happens if I try to do the mean of repeats? <laughs> what about the maximum of repeats? The minimum of repeats? All not applicable. So this is, this is a numeric value, it's just a not applicable value. You can also do things like, uh, let me see, I'm going to give it uh, the value of 3, comma, 5, comma, 7, comma, 9, comma, and then repeat that. I I'm just going to go ahead and cut to the chase and show you one of my favorite functions in R. It's called summary. I just really like this one, so I just have to talk about it early. So summary of repeats. Isn't that wild? So the vector has the values 3, 5, 7, and 9. And na 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 Batman. Okay, right. But when we look at it, those not applicables do not feed into the minimum or the maximum or the mean or the median or the quartiles and all that stuff. But they are counted. So when we run our summary, the software is able to spot 10 not applicables are in this, in this vector, and then we have uh, these other standard metrics that we would compute about it. So it might look as though NA is a string, that is a character, but it's not. In this case, NA is a numeric value, meaning there is no value here. <laughs> Odd but true. All right, now I'm going to show you one of the really helpful features of R next. This is its ability to create random distributions. So I'm using the runif function. The R means a random sampling from, and unif means the uniform distribution. Now, if I spend any time at all talking to you about statistics, I'm going to get excited. So I'm going to try to, to steer away from that, but I'm going to ask you, what is the uniform distribution?
you might think of the uniform distribution in this case as uh, a little like a, uh, a die, an individual die, right? If you, if you roll a, a die repeatedly, you have just as good a chance of rolling a 1 as you do a 6, as you do a 3, as you do a, a 2, assuming it's fair, right? But in this case, you're not locked into integer outcomes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. Instead, you're getting an, a, a value that's drawn from a uniform distribution, no greater probability at, as a, of a higher number or a lower number being drawn from that. So in this case, I've run the uniform distribution sampling function, and I gave it a value of 100. That means I want to grab out 100 values from the uniform distribution. So I can just say randoms on that, and I get back this big blast of information on screen. That's, that's not so easy to read. So maybe I want to try uh, a, a histogram on it. That might help me understand what kind of numbers are coming back. So if I say hist randoms, our first graph, very exciting. OK, so I have, I have given the software um, the instruction to give me back 100 random numbers evenly distributed on the interval from 0 to 1. And I can see just how smooth that distribution is, right? It's not hugely lopsided in one way or the other. Now, I'm, I'm going to open this side by side on screen because I think that might make it a little easier. I'm going to repeat the command. I'm, I'm hitting the up arrow twice to get back to an earlier command I typed. Going back to your command history is a lot easier than retyping a lot of times. So if I just redo this, I redid the random distribution, and now I'm going to do another histogram. See, it changed. I can do another one. It's changing each time. So it's not really smooth, but it could be smoother. Look, I'm, I tell you what, I'm going to make this crazy. I'm going to add a couple zeros. I'm now going to produce 10,000 random numbers. Did it take a long time? It did not. These are computers. <laughs> computers can do this kind of thing all day. So when I look at that distribution, see how much smoother it got? A lot less variability. So one of, the, one of the things that you should take away from that is that if you grab many, many random numbers from a distribution, it's going to look more like that distribution than if you grab just a few. If I grabbed just 10 numbers from the random distribution and did the histogram, it would not look very flat at all. OK. So I'm going to return to the, the code that we had here. I was going to grab random numbers. Oh, sorry. I was going to grab exactly 100 of them. There we go. I'm going to close my little graph here on the side. OK. And now I'm going to come down to some of these functions that we have. I already mentioned the, the summary function. And I think I've actually used length and mean as well. <clears throat> All right. Let's start with our mean for these random numbers. Why is the value pretty close to 0.5? Uh, Why is it close to 0.5? Some of it comes from how we called the function. Remember, we just ran runif, giving it only the number 100. Just give us 100 random numbers. But it's worth knowing which part of it, what, what distribution it was drawing from. And you see in the function call that it says that the uniform distribution has a minimum value of 0 and a maximum value of 1. So the mean being pretty close to 0.5 is exactly what you would expect. If you take the mean value of numbers drawn from 0 to 1, half is, uh, 0.5 is right in the middle of that. That should be the, the mean that you get back. OK. Now, we look at the summary that came back. We see that the mean value looks a little different between these two. Why is that? Because there's some rounding going on. When the, when the mean value is reported in summary, it chops it down to five digits past the decimal in this case. OK. Um, but we have our minimum, our median, our mean, first and third quartiles, and maximum. So, what is a, do, do, I, I'm sure that all of you remember your statistics with great fondness in your hearts, and I'm going to ask you to remind me 
what quartiles are quartiles. Can I pick on you for the first one? I'm going to pick on you for the first one. Okay, what is a min and a max? Mm -hmm. Okay, great, great. Okay, so she's already given us a pretty good head start on our way to quartiles. The minimum and the maximum value are the first and last quartiles that we ever report for these numbers. All right, would somebody like to try on median for size? Median. Median? It's at the middle. That's really good. I like that definition a lot. So if you are to sort all of the numbers from lowest to highest, the one that's in the middle of that list is the median. Great. And that answer is actually quite good for getting us to the first and third quartiles. If you sort the first half of the list and then look in the middle of that, that's your 25th percentile or first quartile. If you look in the last half of the list, sort that and grab the middle item from that, that's the third quartile. Great. So when we see the minimum, first quartile, median, skip the next one, third quartile and maximum, these five points are one way to imagine this distribution. The mean is computed differently, but we so frequently use mean values that they report that in summary as well. Great. Um, length. We already covered length. What is it useful for in a vector? What's that? How many items in the vector? Very good. Great. So we're already on our way. We, we've, we've dealt with having series of numbers that are reported as, uh, as a, uh, a vector. And I want to talk about a very special kind of vector next, and that is the factor. All right, I have just a few things to say about these. All right, when I ran the line saying fruit equals blah, 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 you remember the C function. The C is for creating a, a vector out of multiple things. Here we've given it apple, apple, pear, banana, banana. But then I've used a different kind of function to create a factor from that. So if we look at what fruit itself was, it's just exactly what we fed it, that series of strings uh, that, we, that we had given it. Remember, if I tried to run summary on it, it would say, well, it's a character thing and there are five items in it. Not, not, a, not that complex a summary here. But you see, see up here, I ran fruit f equals a factor built from fruit. So when I type the value fruit f, I see that it is apple, apple, pear, banana, banana, and yet the quotes are gone. Something special has happened here. It also gave me an extra line saying the levels available are apple, banana, and pear. So you see that the software has, has discerned that there were only three distinct values in fruit, apple, pear, banana, and it has kept track of where those appear in this string. We use data like this all the time. In our, in our biological tables, we so frequently make use of these factors, and yet we, we don't stop to think about it. So I, I want to give you the example of uh, coding for sex within biomedical data. So here I'm creating a, another string. Oh, sorry, I, I jumped ahead, sorry. Oh, let me just pull that open wide screen. For me. Okay, so here I've created a vector that has one, two, three, four, five, six values in it. It has four M's, two F's, but M, F, M, M, F, M. I created that, that, that uh, vector of strings, and if I type it, I get it right back again. But then I made a factor from it, and it recognized that there were only two different levels present, male and female. Now, what happens if you're working on someone's table of data in R, and you take a look at the levels in the factor for sex, and you see more than two values? This happens all the time. One of the most common causes is that somebody uses lowercase m's and f's in one part of the table and uppercase m's and f's in the other part of the table. 
And you got to clean that stuff up before you go using that value for something else because it suddenly thinks that capital males are different than lowercase males. That's kind of weird. So, so yes, uh, being able to discern what are all of the distinct levels that we see actually matters quite a lot. Okay, now I, I used the plot function earlier, uh, I'm sorry, the hist function earlier to create a plot. In this case, I can just run plot directly on the factor that we created uh, from the, the, the sex vector here to create a plot. So you can see that the, the software is now separating these values based on what sex they are. And in this case, it's able to show us that we had twice as many males as females. And that's obviously not Hoyle because hiring practices have, been, have really evolved past this and we shouldn't have to ask this question this decade, but there you are. So. Now, we, uh, so we have the ability then to, to do quick visualizations this way. I, I know that a lot of people will say, gosh, it's so much easier to do this stuff in Excel. And it, it's one of the things that we have to fight against quite frequently. Has anyone recently tried to make a histogram from values in Excel? It's painful. It's really egregiously awful. It's much, much faster to do stuff like that in R than it ever would be in Excel. In the same way, if you just had a, a column of M's and F's in Excel, how much typing would it take to get you to a place where you could do a bar graph of the two? But these kinds of visualizations are just built into the R language. So it's a, a really great place to be doing data exploration. Yes, question. Great, let's do that. Okay, so in this case, we plotted uh, the factor built from sex here, though, we tried to run a plot from it, and it didn't work so well. OK, let me, let me try. Um, I'm going to bring us back to the randoms that we did a moment ago. Randoms, remember that? We had 100 values drawn from that. So if I say plot randoms, what happens? Right, so when you, when you have a vector of numbers, plot knows right away what to do with it. But if you give it a bunch of strings, it doesn't really know what, what the default visualization should be? So that's a great question. Um, in this case, it might not be very clear what we've gotten out of this plot, right? That's because we have a hundred items in the list and they're just being shown from left to right and then the value on the y-axis is showing what that individual item is and it's randomly distributed, uniformly distributed. So sometimes you can use other functions to help you along the way. So if I were to say plot sort randoms, is it clear what sort does? Should I stop to explain that one? It's an ascending operation. So we had a hundred randomly drawn numbers and now we've sorted them from lowest value to highest value. So just by adding that, instead of having the, the data just spread willy-nilly all over up, at the, up the vertical axis, I now see that they can be sorted from lowest value to highest value. Sometimes that's very helpful for discerning what's changed. So um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to I'm going to take just a, a little moment to make some. Uh, I'm, I'm going to call these normals. Normals equal R norm, and I'm going to give it a uh, hundred values. If I say plot normals. Instead, so you remember before I used R unif uh, to get a whole bunch of numbers from the uniform distribution. This time I'm using R norm, which pulls from the normal distribution. What do we, what do we call the, the normal, uh, what, what does a normal distribution look like? Feel free to use your finger here. Right? We've got the, the big rise to the middle value and then the fall off to the, the side. So um, if I do a plot of normal values, it might not be completely apparent, but they should be clustered more heavily around the middle line than around the edges. And I can do things like plot the sort of those normals. And this curve that I get out is actually characteristic of normal distributions. So plotting the sort of normals is different than my uniform randoms. Uniform randoms should be distributed along a line, whereas Normals have these little bending edges on them when you sort them this way. So being able to do these quick plots is actually really beneficial for understanding what your data look like. 
Okay, we're running out of time, but I do want to talk about these remaining features. So vectors are used ridiculously commonly. We frequently use matrices as well. Matrices are just like vectors, except that they are multidimensional. I'm going to close this uh, side window here. Okay, so here I've entered matrix. It was kind of a complex call, wasn't it? We've got multiple things that we're feeding it. So I'm giving it a vector of numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I'm setting a parameter called by row to t. What is that t? True. A, a capital T by itself is called, evaluated as true. And I've specified that the number of rows is, tr is 2. So if I type mat, I see what the software has done with that. It's fed the values 1 through 6 into creating a matrix that has two rows, and the software figured out how many columns it would need to evenly distribute those values over two rows. So I didn't tell it three columns anywhere, but it realized that given six items and two rows, it's going to make three columns to, to go with that. So this is a matrix. It is very much like a vector in that every element of a matrix has got to be the same type. So if I do something squarely like um, make one of these a character, you see everything became a character. We still have that, that propensity. Okay, I'm going to back up to make that matrix numbers again. All right. Um, it's very helpful to use some of the functions that come along with these to add names on top of things. So before when I played back Matt, I just had column numbers that were called comma one, comma two, comma three, and row names that were one, comma two, comma. But when I add the dim names thing, it's it's added these names on top of them. So now they're properly called call one, call two, call three, row one, row two. You can call them whatever you like. But uh, in this way, you can force it to to use these names uh, on the on the data you fed it. All right, uh, and. I would point out that we have this benefit that R has all kinds of stuff to help us with linear algebra. Anyone take linear algebra? Anyone remember matrix multiplication and the unit matrix and stuff like that? Okay, well we can just we can just pretend we knew that stuff and run tmat, or we're running the, the transpose function with just a one character function. We get back a transposition. You see that? Our rows have now become columns and our columns have become rows. So that we had basically a, a big diagonal here and it just sort of flipped the entire matrix over that to exchange rows for columns. Sometimes you need to do stuff like that. Now if you're working in Python, that's a lot of lines of code unless you're using some sort of math support library. This stuff just comes for free in R. All right. But now we're going to show that even though we started with a matrix that had only two rows, we're going to glom on another. So uh, remember that our input matrix looked like this. Row 3 looks like this. But our bind, row bind, spotted that we wanted to add on another row that, that just had exactly the same number of columns and stick it on there. So we're able to expand the size of this matrix to add new values. When we look at it, uh, sorry, uh, oh, bigger mat is what I called it. So having read in two rows and three columns, and now added on another uh, a vector to that, I've created a new uh, matrix that has three rows, three columns. The three columns was the same as before. Okay, in a matrix, you are required that every item be the same type. Things get a little crazy when we do... Um, uh, when we do uh, 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 data of different types, of data frames in particular. We're going to get to that in just a minute, though. I wanted to start, I, I always forget lists. Lists are kind of an unusual, um, an unusual format for information, but it's worth talking about. So A and B, as you see, have been pulled from the normal distribution. They're just 10 numbers drawn from that. But you can see that, in, that C is being given the result of a function the t-test function. So if I were to simply run t-test on the command line here, a versus b, 
I'm going to get back something that's got all this nice pretty formatting. It says, well, you've run a Welch two-sample t-test. The data came from A and from B. The t-metric had this value. The degrees of freedom was that. The p-value was so-and-so. The alternative hypothesis, blah, blah, blah. This is, this is the nice text that you know, ends up appearing in, in your paper somewhere. But the object, uh, t-test is also returning a list. And in this case, I've stored that list of, of information in C. So if I type C, well, I get exactly the same report. But C is, is prettifying itself for output. It's actually a list of information. So if I were to use type of, I always forget that, that function name. It is completely reasonable that you would not remember all of these functions every time. The help is, is usually there once you've got your, your network service in place. But you can see that C is actually, uh, it also has, the, it has this type of list and it has a structure as well. We can see that with the str command. So we see that there are nine different, nine different items within this. It's got statistic, parameter, p-value, confidence interval, estimate, null value, etc. And you can use the dollar sign operator to pull those individual pieces out. So I can say c dollar sign statistic and you can see that it's reporting the t statistic for that. I can take c p-value and get just that p-value out. So list is, is kind of a motley collection of, we, we just have a whole bunch of different items that have all been jammed together um, as an output. It's, it's very useful for having a complex set of information you return from a function. So even though c by itself looks pretty, occasionally you're going to want to grab out some particular value from it. Because it's a list, you can use this dollar sign operator to pull stuff out. Okay, um, that brings us to data frames, which are definitely my favorite of all, the op uh, of all the structures. It's kind of sad that we're not giving them a whole lot of time right now, but tomorrow we're going to be back on these with a vengeance. So um, I'm going to go ahead and run this code. So what does label look like? If I just run label by itself, I see case, 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 control, 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 control. How did that come out of those reps? It's, it's the repeat command, yeah. See, I, I was very briefly on the, the high school wrestling team, and they would always ask me, how many reps do you do today, right? You know, so you just have to lift the bar so many times. Each one's a rep. So when I run the rep here, I see that I've told it, I want five reps of case. Case, 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 case. Five reps of control. control. And here they are. We've got our, our, our vector back out. That's great. Reading also has 10 values. We can double check that with uh, the length command, uh, length function, as you recall. Okay, so those correspond to each other. And you see then that I ran what's called a constructor, the data frame constructor, giving it both label and reading. And it's supposed to jam that result into DF. Now before, when we looked at matrices, every value was required to be a number for anything to be a number. But a data frame is totally different. Here we see that data frame has uh, stored numeric and character values in the same structure. If I run the summary on this little guy, I see that label is detected to be a factor. There were five instances of case, five instances of control, and I have minimum, median, maximum, and so on values of reading as well. Almost all of the data that you end up working with in R is quite likely to be this data frame type. When you read a text file, one of the default ways that it tends to happen is as a data frame. And that's because people have c different kinds of information in each of, the, in each of the columns that we read. So that's where we're going to start up again tomorrow. Um, but the data frame piece of this is something that we're going to emphasize quite a lot more tomorrow. Um, How's our pacing? Is, is, this, uh, is this dragging you through the mud on each of these things that you've seen? Okay, you, you got it the first time, or is, it, it, is this about right? About right. Please, by all means, keep stopping me with questions. If you're completely lost, I'm not doing my job. So help me to, help me to find where you are, and we'll make sure that you can take this stuff in.
And of course, this will be this part will also be reflected on the assessment at the end of this module. So um, I'm not going to have you write a bunch of R code for it, but I, I will ask you what's wrong with this or that, for example. So um, I, I hope that we'll uh, be able to to get you to a place where you can recognize how this code should work. Okay, great. Well, I will see you again tomorrow morning at nine o'clock for the next lecture, and uh, I look forward to sharing these recordings with you. Uh, just as soon as I get them onto the machine at home. Thank you.